I'm now really excited to introduce our keynote speaker, someone who's spoken at many different Education Commission of the States events over the years, but someone who comes with a very unique perspective, not only on education, but on life. Senator Joyce Elliott was first elected to the Arkansas House of Representatives in November of 2000. And when she finished her term by 2006, she actually ran for the Senate. Senator Elliott has continued to be a champion for education for multiple reasons in the Arkansas legislature, but many of those come from her more than 30 years of teaching in the classroom. Senator Elliott has taught not only in Arkansas, but she's taught in Florida, Minnesota, and Texas. And in June of 2004, Senator Elliott left the classroom and began working for the College Board, focusing on expanding access to AP classes for students currently underrepresented, African American students, Latino students, rural and low income students. Senator Elliott serves on not only the Joint Budget Committee in the Arkansas Legislature, but also in the uh, Legislative Council on Higher Education. She serves as Chairman of the Vision 2025 Legislative Commission on the Future of Higher Ed, She's chairman of the Whole Child, Whole Community Program in Arkansas, and it's chairman of the Arkansas Comprehensive Social Improvement Plans. I'm very excited to have Senator Elliott here, not just because of her story, but because of the national prominence that she has brought to some of these issues. She not only serves on the National Conference of State Legislators Education Committee, but she's very involved with the Southern Legislative Conference, with the Council of State Governments, and actually changed her flight plans to be here and speak with us because she has to be in Maine later this afternoon because she serves on the board of the National Conference on Education and the Economy. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Arkansas Senator Joyce Elliott. Thank you, Jeremy, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm a teacher, just keep eating, don't mind me. <laughs> just now and then have some eye contact so I know you're at least pretending, all right? At least you are. But it, it is a pleasure to be here. And although I'm from the South, I'm going to have to talk really fast. So for all the Southerners in the room, get ready to listen fast. We can do this. And I'm doing that primarily because I really like to have some time for questions, for Q&A. Um, and by that time, maybe you'll be finished eating. But I, I, I want to really start with um, just some things that I've just been thinking about that's just been on my heart and I suspect on the heart of so many of you. One is, I know everybody here just must be thrilled. There are some Arkansas people in the audience because they are my people. Where are you? Raise your hand. <laughs> my Arkansas peeps over there. So glad that, that you're here. And you know, when it's somebody from your state, you have to call them out. Uh, you just, uh, because you have to go back home. And they'll say, you didn't call us out. Um, I, you know, I was a teacher for 30 years, and I always like to tell people, the only reason I'm not still teaching now is because I am a policymaker, a legislator. The two things I wanted to do, and I fully admit this in public, I wanted to be a teacher. And I did it for 30 years and loved it. I wanted to be a politician. I'm doing it now, and I can't stand here and tell you I love it, but it is some of the most important work that I do. <laughs> and there are days that I do love it, because of course I can see the differences. Well, as we are here to talk about art and, 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 and talk about equity and what it can mean to us, my talk won't exactly just be about art in and of itself. But I think through my story and through other things that I'm going to say, you probably could, could take those things and, and ask yourselves, how could art have played a part in this to soothe the things that happen to people? What if there were artists there to somehow heal the heart and not just have lives that seem stepped on and left out and in some days just burdened by the grayness of the mundaneness of the day because that's what art can do brighten up a beige day. I would be remiss if, if I didn't tell you how concerned I am about DACA and what that might mean to the arts. Because I keep thinking about how many artists we will lose if they have to go someplace else. And why would we do that? And maybe 
something will happen and the artistry of the heart will take over and we will figure it out and this will not be such, such a bad thing that's going to happen because somebody, many somebodies, policymakers like me, will come to our senses and not let this be for real. And it's, it's ironic to me that we are right here in a, in a hotel called the Mayflower. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> The original dreamers to this country were the people who came on the Mayflower, and nobody turned them back. Nobody sent them back. In fact, what we've done, we've created a whole holiday called Thanksgiving Day because they arrived and nobody sent them back. W.E.B. Du Bois said, of all of our rights, of all of our rights, the one that we should fight for the most is the right to learn. And the right to learn, of course, includes the arts. But it is the right to learn to be somebody, as he said, who is a critical thinker, who can question what we do, who can decide if they agree or disagree with what policymakers and their teachers and other people in authority say and do. That's what the arts can do for us. I saw it as a teacher. I always kept this sign on my door. I was a teacher of English and speech, uh, speech communication, and so much went with that. You know, that little bumper sticker that you see a lot of times, you know, the uh, arts uh, are, are not a leisure. Um, and I would always explain to my kids what that meant and how that in your artistic mind is where I want to get to help you be your best self and figure out what it is you think, what you feel, how you can make a contribution. And so one of the poems I always taught, and I love teaching this poem, Miniver Chivi. You are familiar with Miniver Chivi? The Miniver Chivi poem, you need to read this poem because you care about the arts. This is a poem by Edward Arlington Robinson. Miniver Chivi was a guy who looked at himself as an anachronism. He was born too late, he said. Because here we are now, rather than our lifting up the arts and making the arts accessible to everybody and every uh, avenue, he said, we have made art a vagrant. Think about what that means, art as a vagrant. How do we treat vagrants? That's how he sees that we treat the arts. And he goes further in, in, in his poem to suggest that if we don't have the arts, life is just kind of like a khaki suit. And what's worse than a khaki suit, he figures? And that we don't want to have a life of just khaki suit days. And it is the learning that W.E.B. Du Bois talked about that keep our lives from being those khaki suits. And it's what you do that will keep our lives from just being like the khaki suits. So, as we are getting ready in Little Rock, Arkansas, and around uh, people from around the world are coming for the 60th anniversary of what happened there in 1957, where kids just wanted to learn. When we had not even begun to talk about the word equity, they still just wanted to learn, because that is the yearning of a kid's heart, to just want to learn. We get ready for that, and, and, and um, I would be back there working with my, my fellow Senator, uh, uh, Kim Hendren, Jim Hendren. He would not like that, because his father is Kim. He's Jim. Arkansas people don't tell him I said that. <laughs> but because we are in this time, we seem not to be working together. Jim Hendren is a longtime Republican. I'm a longtime Democrat. He's the whitest of white males you've ever seen. <laughs> I am the, the African-American woman. Um, the weirdest kind of no hair and all that stuff that says, you know, she might just be out there. <laughs> but we're very good friends. And we've decided that it is based on so much of what has happened in my life, his life, and stuff that he didn't just know. We've just decided that as policymakers, we're going to work together and step up to try to address some of the issues of race in Arkansas. And about this time, he is about to present our proposal to, the, uh, to a subcommittee that is going to get to pass on it or not pass on it. Last time as it happened, I was the one who had to present it. It was rejected and we are coming back again. 
until we wear them down and make them say yes. So it is his duty today. <laughs> Now, I, Jeremy, if you would do me a favor and let me know when I need to stop at about five minutes or something, that, as I'm going to, I just, I am, I am so driven by my own story and growing up in the South and growing up in a place that broke my heart in so many ways, it's hard to even think about it, but also a place that gave me so many opportunities that I love to think about it. So it's this dichotomy of these two things that brings us great balance. On the one hand, yeah, I survived it. Yeah, I thrived as a result of surviving and I think. But to put me in a place where I don't ever want to put kids like the DACA kids or any kids where they don't have access to the arts, where they don't have that opportunity to learn, that right to learn that W.E.B. Du Bois talked about. But I grew up in a, in a little bitty town I was one of those kids, uh, forced integration. You know, 1954, we were supposed to get with it. 1957, we had a debacle in Little Rock. 1957 is when I started first grade, and I was a precocious little politician, I will tell you right now. <laughs> I did not want, I wanted to know the news, read the news, and everything I could about the news, and I was always right under the heel of some adult, tell me this, tell me that. So I was aware there were soldiers at Central High School. I was aware. And as a kid, you try to make sense of these things. And I couldn't. Because I kept thinking, we were supposed to have soldiers. I didn't know that was necessarily a bad thing. I just thought everybody got soldiers and where were ours? Can you imagine adults trying to explain that to me who wouldn't quit asking, well, why not, why not, why not? I know I must have just been the bane of their existence on, some, on certain days. But I went to a uh, segreg uh, segregated school all the way through the ninth grade, and in the tenth grade I was forced to go to another school. It was the black kids who were moved. It was, there were several small schools, so small white schools, and one large high school after, for the black kids, because after all, we were supposed to go to one school. Uh, my, my bus ride to school was almost two hours just so we could main tame segregation. Now think about what we did when we tried to use busing to even get desegregation started. Think about what we did. We went nuts. But we were perfectly okay with having these black kids on a bus for two hours, but not my kid even for 15 minutes. That was my life. And when I went to this school, it was difficult. I didn't know why it was so difficult for me, but the short, the, the short story is it was difficult for me because I showed up being that precocious little know-it-all that had all A's on my report card because I worked for them. And the people who were receiving me in that school did not like it and called me to the office, two white males and this little 15-year-old black girl and had my transcript and basically said to me, question how I got these grades. Question me. And I thought, oh, this is going to be good because they know I'm smart. No, no, no. They were very upset. And this is a thing I will never forget. You may have these good grades coming from your nigger school, but you won't get these grades here. The right to learn was like into thin air. But being who I was, you know, I just thought, well, that's your problem, not mine. <laughs> I'm going to work at this. But it was not easy. It was made very hard. But as a result of that experience, that did get better the second year. And the other thing I could do really well was play basketball because I lived in the country, and that's all you got a chance to do. We didn't have a lot of things to do, so you learn sports. And I knew, because this was a really small school, uh, they're gonna, everybody loves black people in sports, this won't be tough, because <laughs> the stereotypes are real. But then when I was told, you cannot be on the team, because not because you're not good enough necessarily, but you can't be on the team because we don't have a uniform that would fit you. And I said, and I shouldn't have, but then, you know, hindsight, he deserved it. 
I was so angry. I said to the coach, well, even I could have thought of something better than that. <laughs> and, I'm 15, and I'm 15. And I was sent from the gym uh, to, the, to, the, to that office I dreaded going to. Here I was again. But what it did for me, all those experiences set me on a path of making sure no matter what happened, I would do my level best to make sure every kid was never treated like that. That every kid would have access to a great education. Whether it's the arts, or whether it's vocational, career, technical education. Because in the end, the arts is in all of it. And I do wish you luck in continuing to advocate as you are so that every child, no matter where that child is, as you say, as is your commitment, gets an opportunity to learn, has that right to learn preserved, even with the arts. Because as Pablo Picasso said, one of my favorite guys in the world, I can imagine the pair we could have been had we met up. That would have been great, wouldn't it? <laughs> What a confluence that would have been. But he, he, I love it, and I think about this a lot. He reminds us that the art, you know, just dust off the everyday, just takes away all the everyday dust from our lives. And we have so much dust to be knocked off by the arts. And I trust you will keep your feather dust, dusters handy and that you will work hard for the little Joyce Elias of the world and all of the other kids that are going to come along for whom you would be the curators of their futures. Thank you. Thank you. I can be here for, I can be here for until 1.30. And so uh, I tried to talk fast so you would either talk to me, ask me questions or something. How much time do we have, Jeremy? About 20 minutes. Oh, this, I did great. Yay. You know, like that, like the girl with the LeBron jersey on. Yay, I'm a champion today. I was trying to cut back because there's so much to say because I really wanted to have a conversation here. Are we in a position to do so? Because I could have just kept talking. Okay. Any last questions? No. Um, what is your world like as a policymaker, and what is the best way for us to be communicating with mm -hmm. you and the people in your role? All right, that, that's a really good question because my role as a policy policymaker is way too comfortable because you let it be too comfortable. That's the first thing to remember. Policymakers will move on, on many things they normally wouldn't when they are pushed to do so, when they are made just as uncomfortable as you are, as you may be about approaching us. Because what we have done in education, and policymakers have done this, we've absolutely taken the joy out of, out of education by turning education into testing. And as a policymaker and as a teacher, I see how those two things have conflicted and what it's done. But it means little if I'm the only voice or if two or three people are the only voice there. And uh, our big hope for really integrating the arts in the way the arts should be is for, you, is for you to make sure policymakers are listening to you. I mean, you will do your work and it will have impact, but I promise you the biggest impact we can have is when we make the arts, for example, as important as football. And I'm not anti-football. Uh, when we do that, that is not going to happen without your, I, and I say it this way on purpose, being in our faces and demanding that we do what we should do. And this thing, and one of the things I find from people so much is 
you, whatever it is you do, if you teach or if you are the head of some organization, you like to say, I just want to go do my job and just let them leave me alone. When I was a teacher, I was always saying to teachers, this is a bad attitude you have that you want to just go in your classroom and teach and just leave me alone. Because nobody is leaving you alone outside of your classroom. Have you picked up on that yet? <laughs> and so I, take the time and, and it's going to be inconvenient. It's not comfortable. But that's what we're there, we're there for, to listen to you. And it makes me a better policymaker when people who literally know what they're talking about are giving me information. Because absent good information, here is what happens. I know you think policymakers do stupid stuff just to be stupid. I know that. <laughs> but you are wrong. I mean, you really are. Because do you know anybody who wakes up a day and say, my mission in life is to be stupid. That person doesn't exist. So, since policymakers are people, that means that applies to them. So when you see policymakers do something and you think it's the most god-awful stupid thing anybody could ever do, they are probably doing it in many cases because you didn't step in, did not step into the gap and give them the information they need. Because when good people and inform people don't do that, you leave us to our own devices to come up with our own conclusions and our own policies. So every time you see something that looks ridiculous, you need to ask yourself, well, could I have done something about that? Had I participated in the civic process? And that's a serious matter. They really don't do it just so you can continue to tell us we're ridiculous. In here beats a heart. I was just thinking this morning how the word heart and how much, now I'm getting off on things I would have said. If that's okay, I'll go ahead and do it. Since, <laughs> since y'all didn't have questions, I kept thinking about you know, the violence that we do to the heart and, and thinking, oh my gosh, you know, heart, that's the last three letters of heart. And the violence we do to the, to the, to the heart. And we do that sometimes through the policies that we have. And, and uh, we don't have to let this keep happening. I don't mean to preach on it, Jeremy, but that's something I feel really passionate about. I guess I don't like it when I have to guess what you're thinking, when I have to guess what the best policy would be when you could have just told me, but you didn't. You just wanted to go into your places and do your work and go, don't touch me with politics. Not a good idea. Very good. So make me stop preaching here. <laughs> I'm telling you, I grew up in the Missionary Baptist Church in the <laughs> South. <laughs> I know how to preach. Okay. <laughs> All right. My name is Ben Martin. I'm from Missouri, so uh, a neighbor of yours. <laughs> yeah. uh, what are some of the most promising education policies that you are hearing about and working on right now? Yeah. I, I, I'm a big supporter of, um, I mean, the A-plus program. I mean, I know you all know about this, but I'm a big supporter of the A-plus program. Arkansas has a great one, and I know there are other people here who do as well. I've talked to somebody from Oklahoma. I know somebody is here from uh, North Carolina. See, I do my homework. I know who's here. Um, and th so that's, that's, that's a program that I'm really working, trying to, and I've gotten legislators who actually go, oh, go to the Thea Foundation in Arkansas to see what's going on there. And um, so I get legislators to do that, and every single one we've gotten to go and listen to how that program changes success for kids, every single one has been impressed. And more and more, we're kind of getting a little bit more funding to help do that. But some of the other things that are, that are happening in our state, you know, we, we have done a relatively decent job legislatively trying to make sure that kids have time, that there's art in the schools. And we are doing a much better job, too, of lifting up the arts. Well, I would say democratizing the arts, because we are, we are doing more to appreciate that art is not just the traditional stuff that legislatively we are, you know, that, that we put these boxes around and recognize, and especially art of those who have been left out of the recognition 
we're making a big deal with creative arts regarding you know, uh, the blues highway and honoring that whole Delta thing where it's, it's an economic driver. And our, our Latino population is growing more and more in our state and we are getting really good ideas from that population informing our arts. Kind of like what I envision is kind of like uh, the WPA when the government actually, not that we're gonna go back to this, the, but the government actually paid people, you know, uh, to create art, and we still see some of it around. And, and what, I, what I want us to look forward to doing is between government and, pub, and, private, uh, and the private sector, do more of those things of commissioning those folks who have been left out of how we have defined the arts and lift, lift, lift up those arts. And Arkansas is doing more of that. You know, we've got people here like, we've got John Brown over here with the Wingate Foundation and, and they do a great job of helping us fund the arts. And um, in Arkansas, we have supported for millions of dollars in a small town in the South, El Dorado, we call it El Dorado, although we know it's El Dorado. <laughs> and in Arkansas, the car doesn't exist anymore. You really could live in El Dorado and drive an El Dorado Cadillac. That's how we talk. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's just the way it is. You know, we, we're artistic in our expression, may I say that. But that town has decided that. There are many well-to-do people uh, in El Dorado disproportionate to the population. Lots of money there. They finally figured out their town was just dying. And the way they have chosen to come back, and they're going to have a big opening like September, uh, last of September. They have chosen to have their comeback through the arts, and it is a huge undertaking, supported partially by us in the legislature, because we know it will matter in the end. It is a huge undertaking, and it is going to be just fantastic to have that happen. So we look for those things we can support. So, okay. Thank you. My name is Christy Wilkins uh, with an agency called Dramatic Results in California. Mm -hmm. And my question is, how do you define and how do you operate with the distinction between free speech and hate speech? Be be between free between speech? Between free speech and hate. Uh, yeah, that, that's a good question because, you know, I think there, there is always going to be kind of this gray line because one of the things that uh, when I was planning on talking longer, that was going to be a part of my talk about art and hate speech and free speech and the whole Confederate memorial thing right now. Because I think that's a good example. You know, when, when we get to a point that free speech is designed, I think, just to hurt people, that's not the point, that's not necessarily the point, I think. When it gets to a point that it's designed to hurt people mentally, there, there is a line there. I'm not, and, and that one to me is real fuzzy because, you know, I don't want people to be hateful, but they have the right to be hateful. But when it gets to a point that it's speech that begins to incite harm, I really think that's, that's, that's hate speech. But more importantly, although I think it might not rise to being necessarily illegal, I think hate speech for me is derived from something directed to or about uh, people that concerns their immutability, like I can't change that I'm a woman, so attacking me because I'm a woman is to me is just is hate speech, or because I'm African American, or because I'm LGBT, or whatever. Um, and, and I think some of these things are so gray that only a court's going to figure it out. But when, you, when somebody can't change what they are, or when some things that are so ingrained in us, like I have a right to my religion, that's where the real hate speech comes in for me, when you start to attack with those kind of things as your motivation to do so. And um, I've, I've had a lot of it directed at me. And I, I mean, I, in, in 2005, I worked on the, the, uh, the DREAM Act in Arkansas. Almost got it passed. We lost by two votes and haven't been able to get it passed since that time. But I was stunned the amount of hate speech I had, and it was hate speech directed at me for trying to do that for kids. And it was things like, I was targeted by a, a white 
hate group as far as I'm, well, the FBI thought so. When the FBI came to talk to me and, and, um, and explain to me how I was being targeted and I was on, on this website and I need to take a look at it, I felt what hate speech was and I lived it. So it, it's not something we ought to take lightly and it's not something good people ought to be silent about. That's what bothers me more than the haters. Because there are more of us than there are them, but they don't know it because we sit by and be silent because we don't want to be uncomfortable. And that's just not the way this country is going to survive with that kind of attitude. Yeah. Is that it? That's it. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I so appreciate it.